Let's talk about exercise first. I just can't stand going to the gym. You sound like you might be lazy. I am lazy. One of the mistakes I made with Smarter Not Harder was using the laziness principle as a hook. People like to talk about lazy as much as they like to talk about death. <laughs> so here's what laziness means, and it's not what people think. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. I need brain supplements to remember. I can't remember anymore. I've got the brain supplements. I know. I want to talk to you about that. So first off, Dave, welcome back to the show. Since you last were on the show, what happened to Bulletproof Coffee? You just got to tell me. I, about three years ago, I got removed from the board of directors. And so they're doing their own thing. Uh, Bulletproof's uh, been acquired by a small investment bank. So I don't have anything to do with Bulletproof anymore. Was it okay? Like, were you very upset? Like, did it, did it stress you, know, you it out? Wasn't, uh, it wasn't the outcome that I wanted for myself um, or for the investors. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's always a, just a strange place to be where you, know, you build something really, really big, a big movement, a big, uh, big company. Uh, and then, you know, investor preference and things like that all happen the way they happen. So, you know, lessons learned on raising venture capital and, and ways to do that. Well, since you first came on the show in 2014, I've been a regular user of, of Bulletproof Coffee, but now lately I've been using, I've been drinking Danger Coffee every morning. Ah, and the difference, huh? <laughs> you know, for me, it's hard to tell. I'm, okay. I'm really clueless about, like I could take vitamin C every day, work out every day, whatever. I cannot tell the difference in my body with anything. And so I just hope that the science is all correct about what each thing does for you. And I'm, I'm very confident that everyone listening to this is deficient in minerals right now. And there's tons of reasons for that. And putting minerals back in and getting more electrolytes in your coffee is only going to do good things. So the, what we've done is we've put in danger coffee. By the way, it's called that because who knows what you might do. Like it's a good kind of danger. Like I could do anything, right? I could you know, win a chess tournament. I could, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to have to d double down on my taking of the danger coffee now. Yeah. And it, it doesn't have any mold. And, you know, if you look at some of the brands I've worked with before that maybe once said mold on their label, now they just say clean. And I don't know what that is, um, but I do know that danger coffee says mold free on the label. And I know that it has a therapeutic dose of trace and ultra trace minerals and electrolytes in it. And it tastes like the most amazing coffee because it is, it's very high grade. And once every quarter, we come out with ceremonial grade, which is some of the, the most flavorful, highest end coffee on the planet that's also mold free and is also remineralized. So that's a very limited amount, kind of like you go to a winery and there's only so many number of bottles. We'll, we'll buy up an entire lot from a micro plantation and, um, and make that available on a first come first, first serve basis. So we're, we're getting into the premium and ultra premium and it's, it's just so fun and it tastes so good. And, uh, and you, since, since you left Bulletproof, I guess you started Danger Coffee and now you have this new book, Smarter, Not Harder, The Biohacker's Guide to Getting the Body and Mind You Want. And I tell you, so I, I read the book and two things, two things struck out at me at first. One is I really like the concept and the way you explain it, this evolutionary aspect that the human body the body itself wants to be lazy. It doesn't want to work out for hours in a gym. It's, it's been busy hunting and gathering and whatever. It doesn't want it. Your, your point is basically there are other ways There are sort of quote unquote lazier ways to get the health, the maximum health you want to achieve. Yeah, it, it, there's that. And it's also in the West, we think we are our body. And the reality is your body truly does not exist. Because as you're listening to the show, some cells in your body are falling off or getting pooped out or they're getting burned and broken down and recreated into new things. So we're really more like an eddy in matter that's moving through time. Like if you're to, you watch a river at the bottom of a waterfall, you can see there's a pool and it's always swirling around, but it's not the same at any one second. It, it's like it's a you're seeing a motion through water, but it's not mm. the same water all the time. Well, your body's the same way, so it doesn't exist. Um, 
what it is is kind of a hollow tube, starts with your mouth, ends in your butt, that's just moving through food and air and light and everything like that, which is creepy and gross. Except your body has its own consciousness that's not you. And then you take credit for what your body does. And when your body is jacked in a bad way versus jacked, you know, in a good way, um, well, then you take credit for that too. And if your body is anxious because you fed it the wrong thing or it's lacking zinc or something and you think, well, I'm anxious. It must be my mother-in-law or it must be because I just lost at chess again. You know, it, it could be <laughs> that, anything, right? But I have to my, tell you, that does make me very anxious. Like that is, <laughs> it, it's very disturbing when I lose. So the question is, is it disturbing because of a mental story? In your case, I'm, I'm sure that's part of it. Or maybe the feeling of being disturbed, you were easy to disturb because your hardware was not running very well and it felt disturbed and it just gave you a story about it being chess. Well, I think that's true. And I think, and I don't know if this is a story or not, but I definitely think as I age, it is harder for me to have the stamina I had when I was younger. And it's harder for me to focus the brain the way I was when I was younger. So if like you kind of mentioned, there's lots of different things people want to do with their health. They either want to get stronger or they want to have more stamina or they don't want to get sick or they want their brain to improve. And yeah. I'm definitely in the category of like, I want more energy and I want more brain power. And this brings me to the second aspect of the book though, which is I get sometimes really stressed out. I read a lot of these books about nutrition and, and, you know, I have all the latest and greatest on, on the podcast. And many of the people you mentioned in the book have been, have been on the podcast and it's, it stresses me out because there's so many like minerals and vitamins and supplements and foods to remember. And one person says kale is good. The other person says kale is bad unless you do this to it. I just have trouble remembering what I'm supposed to do. And I feel, I get, I do get a little anxious feeling overwhelmed that there's like so much to do to stay just reasonably healthy, let alone improve. Mm, it sounds like you've got some perfectionism going on there. That could be <laughs> like, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Do I start well, like with you, 150 supplements or you're not alone. And the first thing you want to do is, is in fact, this is funny. It's where smarter, not harder comes from the, the book. It is that we're all different. So where you are today, it includes your age, you know, your gender, your hormone status, your nutrient status, your toxin status, genetics, like all that stuff is in there. And then how tired are you? Like, what's your lifestyle like? How much do you drink? All that stuff, it boils down to what's the state of my hardware right now? How's my body? How's my mind from a, a cellular biological perspective? And then, well, what matters to you? Like, where do you want to go? And then how much energy? how much suffering or hard work. And like you said, you want your energy back, you want your brain to work better, right? Someone else, maybe I wanna be younger, I wanna be stronger, uh, I wanna be able to manage stress better, and we all want all those things. So I'm in the, the really late stages of developing and launching an AI tool that'll help you zoom in on your goal. And then you get to decide how much do I wanna invest in time, energy, and hard work in order to get there. And if you're saying I have 10 minutes a week, I don't want it to hurt very much, uh, and I have, you know, $214 in my budget for this, then this tool knows everything I've ever said, everything I've written, everything in my research library, and can make recommendations for you, very specific granular ones about lifestyle and supplements. And in the meantime, what I've done is I've put together, well, what are the things everyone needs to work better? And if you go to vitamindake.com, vitamin D-A-K-E, um, there's two supplements that just everybody has to start with. I don't care what your goals are. If you want your meditation to work, you want your brain to work, you want your exercise to work, you want your stress hormones to work, you need vitamin Dake, which is a specific combination of D-A-K and E. And these do all sorts of things in the body, but one thing they do is they tell minerals where to go. And then Minerals 101 is the supplement on the same site. This is macro minerals beyond what's in Danger Coffee. Get your fat solubles and your minerals dialed in and then everything you do works better because now when you send a signal to your body to focus at that chess tournament or to focus when you're doing a, a bicep curl, the body says, oh, isn't that great? I have enough zinc, enough copper, enough magnesium that I can actually make the enzymes necessary to fold that protein or to make that neurotransmitter or to make testosterone. So now I can be responsive to signals from the environment. 
So vitamin D and Minerals 101 is foundational for everyone. And what I learned in the book too is you can't, like I was taking vitamin D supplements every day, but particularly during COVID, but you can't just, in the book it says you can't just take vitamin D because there's interactions with these other ones. Like uh, oh, you yeah. can actually get kidney stones if you just take too much vitamin D. Especially if you take vitamin D and you're eating kale and spinach and beets and almonds and even too much chocolate, right? Because they have additional things that cause uh, kidney stones. So vitamin D by itself is better than being deficient in vitamin D, but it has risks unless you take it with vitamins K and A. And unfortunately, the vegan movement has convinced us that plant-based vitamin A is the same as vitamin A. It's not. Your body doesn't convert plant-based vitamin A into real vitamin A very well. And the plant-based stuff displaces the vitamin A that you need for healthy eyes, healthy vision, healthy brain, healthy immune function. What is so, vitamin A? Uh, vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. It's known as retinol. Uh, and it's formed in our skin, uh, usually. And it's formed in our liver. And when you have enough vitamin A, your immune system works. When you don't, it doesn't work. And it works to balance out vitamin D. So vitamin A and D kind of dance with each other. Vitamin A actually comes out more in the evening and vitamin D more in the morning. And then vitamin K, which is in that vitamin D formula, vitamin K helps to keep calcium where it belongs in your bones and inside your cells and not to allow systemic calcification, which is what vitamin D promotes without it. So it's a harmonized balance of all the fat solubles you need plus all the minerals you need. And it's meant to be affordable. Vitamin D, you get a 60-day supply. It works to something like 22 bucks a month. So it's not a big investment, but it has thousands of pathways in the body it affects. And minerals are slightly more expensive, but not that much more expensive per month. That's what we all do first when you're in the biohacking mode. And then everything that you do to improve yourself, it's easier because now at least you can respond to your environment instead of saying, well, I know you picked up heavy stuff. And I know I wanted to build muscle. I didn't have the raw ingredients. So how about you have some stress instead of some muscle? And that's what most of us are doing in the gym today. So I want to back up a second and talk about like, how did you get into all of this? Like, I know like when we way back 10 years ago, when we first spoke, you know, before you started Bulletproof Coffee, you were stressed, you were a lawyer, you were I was overweight. A lawyer, no Weren't you a lawyer? No, I was a tech entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Oh, I didn't know. For some reason, I thought you were a lawyer. You know, maybe I'm confusing you with Rich Roll here. So You know, it, it could be. The difference is that uh, I eat cows and Rich eats things that cows eat, but uh, I like Rich. He's a cool guy. Yeah. So, so, okay. So you were a tech entrepreneur, but you were overweight, you were unhappy, you were stressed. What was going on? Well, by the time I turned 30, I had weighed 300 pounds. I weigh about 198 pounds. I'm 6% body fat right now. Um, I had high risk of stroke and heart attack, chronic fatigue syndrome, crippling brain fog. Uh, I had three surgeries in my knees before I was 23 because of arthritis. My fasting blood sugar was 117. Uh, and I was on antibiotics every month for 15 years for chronic sinus infections and strep throat. I had mold toxin induced brain damage from chemical induced brain damage, uh, diagnosed by Dr. Daniel Amen. So my body's a complete shit show. My brain's a shit show. I'm stressed all the time biologically. I'm stressed all the time emotionally as well because I had trauma in there that I hadn't dealt with. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I, my accelerator is pressed all the way to the floor. I'm slowing down. I can push harder, but it doesn't do anything. And my career's taken off. I'm 30. I'm going to Wharton Business School, right? I've already led strategic M&A and strategic strategy for a $36 billion tech company. And I was a co-founder of part of that company. Like I had a great career. I made 6 million bucks when I was 26. I lost it when I was 28. And my brain was just cooked. And it was out of desperation when doctors couldn't do anything. Uh, I went to a longevity doctor. Um, there were very, very few in the world back then. And I'd found him because I was running an anti-aging nonprofit group in Palo Alto. And I was learning from people three times my age how they got young. Because I felt like I was old before I was 30. So I was, well, I'll fix my brain using what the old guys do. And it worked. And then I went to this doctor who I met through the group. And he said, Dave, bad news. Your testosterone is lower than your mom's. Because he had done the work on my mom. I'm like, it actually was. Well, so what, was, what were the actual numbers? Because again, 
I'm 56. I, and mm-hmm. everybody tell I haven't gotten tested for this sort of stuff. Everyone tells me now's the time I need to get start getting tested for testosterone I was, levels. I was that. tanked because I was 300 pounds. My body converted testosterone to estrogen very quickly. And I was obese, which makes extra estrogen. Uh, so my numbers would have been in the hundreds. Right huh. now, my number is about a thousand, which is where I feel best. And what's right? and what's I'm, normal? I mean, what's I'm the like, normal range? Um, the normal range, like I'm I'm lean, like super lean. I feel so good. Um, the normal range is about seven hundred to a thousand. And what's happening right now is testosterone levels in men and women are plummeting across the developed world. If you are twenty five or thirty right now, your normal testosterone levels are the same levels your grandfather had if you went back to the 80s. So our diet, all this plant-based stuff, the plant-based oils, all the fragrances and synthetic plastics and chemicals, including atrazine, which is allowed to be sprayed in the US that makes frogs uh, turn hermaphroditic. All that stuff is affecting your hormones. That Axe body spray is kind of, you know, cutting off your balls chemically Hmm. anyway. You don't need to be, to be castrated that way by the chemicals around you. So since you're living in that world, they're going to tell you you have normal testosterone. I'll tell you, if you're a man, I don't care if you're 80 or you're 18, if your numbers aren't around 800 or higher, you're probably not showing up in the world the way you want. It's not about having muscle. It's about caring about your life and the world around you. It's the hormone of desire. I didn't have that. I just had really strong willpower, but it wasn't enough. I went to the gym 90 minutes a day, six days a week. Like I beat myself up, half weights, half cardio, low fat, semi-vegetarian diet. All I did was stress myself out and I had a 46 inch waist when I started and after 18 months of that regimen. And I'm like, what do I have to do? Eat less lettuce? And so it was that backdrop. I'm like, I'm gonna do something about it. I got into longevity. Pretty soon, all these people who were teaching me so much asked me to be the president. I'm like this 28 year old president of a longevity group where I'm the only guy under 60 in the room. So I learned from my elders. They taught me so much. I interviewed the, the, the guys that, that today I would interview on my podcast, like, like Andrew Huberman. That uh, was maybe episode 400 before he had a show. I interviewed him. Well, you go back 20 years, I would have been interviewing you know, his dad at this longevity group. So I just got mentored by the best in the world. And I felt called after my career in tech. I just started a blog. Maybe, maybe I could keep someone from going through all the crap I went through. And I thought five people would read it. It turns out I have millions of followers and you know eight books, half of them New York Times bestsellers, 400 million downloads on the podcast. And I built Bulletproof that did more than 600 million in lifetime revenue before uh, I uh, was removed from the company. So uh, the whole movement of biohacking, I started the biohacking movement. And by the way, this end of May, early June, so May 30th, 31st, June 1st in Dallas, the 10th annual biohacking conference. It's in its 13th year, but I didn't count the the pandemic years, even though we did virtual conferences. So the oldest and largest biohacking conference that started the movement, and I'm hosting it again, biohackingconference.com. Wow. Look okay. Biohack- plug. People barely notice. I'm going to, I'm going to go. I need, I need it. I need to hack my body. Uh, James, you're welcome, man. I'll, I'll get you a pass. <laughs> so, okay. So what, you know, again, in terms of the lazy part like part part of the implication when you when you say that in the book is that maybe you don't your workout doesn't have to be 90 minutes for instance like what's and you give examples and you give exercises and and in every chapter you give so much advice it's incredible and now i just want to figure out like what to focus on like what for me starting out if i don't want to go crazy can i focus on you know your goals are cognitive function and yeah. energy, right? Yeah, I I wear out by the end of the day. Like I completely wear out, and sometimes yeah. I need to function later in the afternoon or evening. So, and where are you living right now? You were itinerant when I first. Uh, yeah, you were homeless when I first interviewed you. But I yeah, think I you was homeless then. Here. Yeah, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a southerner now. You can tell I'm a southerner. Yeah, you you've totally got the vibe, right? Yeah, it's really changed my life completely. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> so. Where would you start? I, I was going to see if you were near, I think our lo- closest location for Upgrade Labs uh, would be in uh, Tennessee. We're opening one. So at Upgrade Labs, we've got 27 locations around the country in the process of opening. It's a franchise. And these are biohacking facilities where you come in, we do a cell health analysis with medical grade tech. 
we measure what's going on in your body. Where's the fat, the skinny fat that's around your organs that's dangerous? We get a, a picture of your metabolism and then we use AI to recommend what you do in the facility. But you're not near one. And by the way, guys, own an upgrade labs.com if you want to open a franchise, maybe in Atlanta, so James can come in. <laughs> the uh, the idea there is so you're not going to do that. You're going to go through smarter, not harder, and you're going to read the two sections that are on energy and brain. And then you're going to pick some practices. We'll pick some some low uh, cost ones. Um, the lowest cost way to get your energy and your brain back is be better at sleeping. How's your sleep? My sleep is okay, but I do take things for it. I, I Not always, but I often take things for sleep. Uh, things like THC or Ambien or herbs? Like what are we talking about? All, all of the above. And sometimes something like, in 2010, I was anxious. So this is 14 years ago. Yep. And I started taking, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know if I want to say unfortunately, but unfortunately I got prescribed Klonopin and Klonopin is extremely addictive. Yep. Uh, like it's unbelievable. Like I took it for a few months, no more anxiety. Like it's amazing how it works. It, it yep. blocks your anxiety thoughts. But then I figured, okay, no more anxiety. I'm going to get off of it. And you just can't. Like it's, it's really addictive. And so, you know, I've been on this 14 year journey of weaning off of, the clonopin, which I mostly have, but sometimes I, I have to take that to sleep. And, oh, and that supposedly it. doesn't really improve the quality of your sleep, though. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't gone deep on that drug, but I do know that my mother was on it for a long time because of epilepsy. So let's see. So your sleep architecture is broken, I would say. So the short version to improve your sleep would be go to sleepwithdave.com this is totally free it's very forward it's just we haven't even had our first date but okay I, I mean it was it was the cool hair james no. <laughs> yeah uh, it, it's by far the best url of my entire career uh, because no one's going to forget that it's free it's just everything i know about how to sleep better because i was the guy who would get five minutes of deep sleep and five minutes of REM sleep every night my sleep was garbage I get 90 minutes of deep, 90 minutes of REM in six and a half hours uh, most nights. And I don't take anything other than some supplements like magnesium and herbal stuff that supports sleep. And the difference is not what you're trying to do. The difference is the environment around you. And it's in the very definition of biohacking. When I first was introducing this idea in this global movement, it's the art and science of changing the environment around you and then inside of you so that you have control of your own biology. Let's go back from that evolutionary perspective, James. Two billion years ago, our insane numbers of ancestors back, some cells floating around in the ocean. We don't really know what cell it was, but it's what we are now. And then these little mitochondria, these bacteria, and then we say, oh, our cells captured the mitochondria and use them as mobile power plants. A more accurate assessment is these little bacteria found a cell and they're like, check this out. It's a mobile Petri dish. We can move in and take over. Hmm. Well, back two billion years ago, these bacteria, they were very dependent. Okay, bacteria are dumb, but they do have intelligence. They have to react to their environment. So their environmental sensors then make a decision. So they look at light. In the morning, sunrise, it's red and it's at an angle. And then in the middle of the day, it's hot. You have bright, full spectrum light right above you, like that LED above you right now. And then in the evening, it gets red again. In the middle of the day, there's a ton of food because they're eating algae. After the sun goes down, there's less algae. The temperature drops. It becomes dark. And then they go to sleep. They drop down in the ocean. And then the next morning, they rinse and repeat. So if you want to fix your sleep and get off all the stuff that's helping you go to sleep, when you wake up in the morning, tell your cells it's morning. The number one thing that I listen to is light. And within light, there's five aspects of light. There's multiple colors they need to see, like blue light wakes you up. It's not bad for you in the morning, but intense blue light with no red and infrared is bad for your eyes and your brain. And that's what you get if you're indoors. So wake up, go outside, take off your glasses so they don't filter out the ultraviolet that your body needs, and then walk around or sit there for at least 10 minutes, ideally 20 minutes in the morning. For you, probably at noon is a good idea as well. So, hey, look, it's the middle of the day. And then in the evening, seeing sunsets good. After that, you dim your lights. 
And since you can't dim lights in hotel rooms and you have a life, I started one of the first circadian glasses companies. It's called True Dark. It's something I don't talk about that much because I do a lot of stuff. And we actually filed a patent on these, but there's glasses that control all the colors of light and the angle of the light and the intensity of the light, which is what your body listens to. So I wear those in the evening if I'm going to be under bright lights or if I'm flying. We have a study that's about to be published showing that those glasses, the True Dark sleep glasses, they cause the same changes in your brain waves that you get from advanced meditation. Hmm. So in 15 minutes, they drop you into a sleep state so that you're just, oh, I'm ready to relax. So at night- so you put these on lights. at night? Yeah, keep them on at night, dim the lights. And oh, that thing about food, the number two thing after light is when was there the majority of your food? Don't eat after the sun goes down, except you probably will. Just eat as early as you can and don't eat within three hours of bedtime. Those two things, along with maybe lowering your thermostat at night, are probably enough for most people to fix your sleep as long as you do the other thing. And this is unplug everything that has a light or tape it over and get blackout curtains. Uh, a study in Japan found that the amount of light from street lights that leaks around curtains is enough to increase depression by 69%. Wow. So what I think you have, James, is you have a circadian biology problem masquerading as a sleep problem. And I just taught you, you know, 20% of what's on the, the Sleep with Dave program. And again, I don't want any money for that. That is just free knowledge. It also includes the glasses and all the, the tools that I use, but everything that you can do, you can do it for free. You can put aluminum foil in your windows instead of spending 40 bucks on blackout curtains on Amazon. Like it's up to you, right? Aluminum foil is just uglier. Well, okay. I'm going to do all that. I, I think with, with food, I tend to, I follow that advice. I do no food three hours before I'm going to go to sleep Good. and and I tend to go to sleep pretty early, but I, and I've spoken to Andrew Huberman about the going outside first thing when you wake up, but I don't really, I find that I don't really do it. I need to really do it. All right. Here's what to do. I lived in Canada for 13 years and it's funny. I've been teaching the circadian biology thing. Uh, since my very first blog post in 2011. Uh, and I, I love that that Andrew Huberman's bringing in the university aspect, and he's, he's a master teacher and structurer of knowledge. Um, before we started his podcast, uh, we talked about this when he was on The Human Upgrade on my podcast, and I'm like, this guy's doing really cool stuff. And then now he's got this giant podcast, and I'm, I'm so happy because when we have Stanford professors talking about biohacking, uh, what we're doing is we're now validating best practices that we can figure out just by looking at our own data. I've tracked my sleep every night for 15 years. I used to wear a headband when I would go to sleep because you couldn't have a, a ring. And I was CTO and co-founder of the first company to get heart rate from your wrist the way Apple phone does mm -hmm. now because I was so broken from a circadian perspective. Um, so you're not going to go out in the morning. When I lived in Canada, I could go out in the morning, but it didn't matter because it was dark and gray and gross. Um, and just raining. No offense to Canadians that? out there. Well, I mean, sorry, there's a reason that all Canadians dream of retiring in uh, the Palm Desert. So guys, uh, I, I'm a Canadian citizen. So like everyone who can afford it in Canada, I go somewhere south during the winter mm -hmm. because it's part of maintaining your health. So what did I do when I was up there? You get really bright lights, halogen are best. You get halogen work lights still. LEDs are not as good, but bright light in the morning that is at eye level, not above you. That's mm -hmm. as good as you can get indoors. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do all this. I'm, okay. I'm going to commit to it. And you also red light in the morning. So um, red light's another uh, really common biohack. People thought I was insane when I started the biohacking movement. Like, you guys, wear these cool glasses. And I also started one of the first red light therapy companies. And these are very small compared to what I was doing at Bulletproof. But I'm like, I, gotta, I, I can't buy what I want. Like, how do I make it available so I can, I can have it and others can have it that's cost effective? So that tell, me about the, light. tell me about the red yeah. light therapy. Like my wife does this. She stands in front of some like a board and it shoots oh. red light at her. It, it could be even the true light board uh, that I make. There's, you can buy this stuff on Amazon. There's stuff everywhere now. It, it, there's a lot of people just buying red LEDs from China and putting them out there. And they all reasonably work. You want red and infrared. And ideally, I've added amber to the stuff I make because amber 
is also a waking up frequency that helps with small blood vessels. But mm -hmm. red light, it doesn't just help your skin look better, and it really does do that. It helps to set your circadian biology. Your body wants red in the morning and wants red at night. You can't go to sleep, go to take that same red panel, don't necessarily shine it in your eyes, shine it on your body from the neck down and just watch what happens. Your body just relaxes. It, it's a signal that you can't see that your body sees and your body goes, oh, I guess I should go to sleep now and then you do. Hmm. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna do all this. So this, that's sleep. Okay. And, and, and do you have a sleep tracker, an Apple Watch, an Aura Ring, a Whoop, anything like that? We have the, um, what is it, the Eight Sleep mattress? Yeah, eight Sleep is good, yeah. I haven't used the tracking facility yet, but I should do it. I, I should do that. Well, James, I mean, I, I remember from our interview, you're, uh, you're pretty good at, at understanding the track what you hack ethos. Sure. I'm smarter, not harder. So get the data. Are you waking up 15 times a night? You don't know it? Do you have apnea? There, there's so many things you can do and chilling your mattress, which is what eight sleep does. It's a pretty good idea, but chilling your mattress in a room that has you know, blinky lights from your phone charger, uh, is not going to work the same. So you want to line up your, your sleep environment so that you really get a, a signal to your body that says it's, it's time. And then you're not going to want the content. Yeah. That's the goal. Okay. The other thing you can do is another biohack. This is towards the end of Smarter Not Harder. And I've been teaching uh, for now 11 years. I've been taking senior executives and entrepreneurs and celebrities and people through a five-day intensive brain training thing. The company's called 40 Years of Zen. And we're expanding that right now. Uh, so about 1,500 people have, have had these transformative experiences that are on par with the psychedelic journey just from looking at their own brain waves and reordering it. At home, you can do something called heart rate variability training. And in fact, I used to advise this company back in 2008. Um, it's called HeartMath. And this is different than what you get from your eight sleep or from one of your, uh, your tracking devices. It's a little thing you put on your ear and then it teaches you how to breathe. You're like, oh, breathing? I know how to do that. But when you're breathing and you do something, it feels like it's in your heart it's consciously learning what it feels like when your body goes into fight or flight versus rest and reset. Once you learn the feeling, there's something you can do when you take a deep breath and you exhale that changes the spacing of your heartbeat that causes your body to want to go to sleep. It's been really transformative for me. So now I have, I've learned the signal of my body kicking into anxiety the second it happens. It's a feeling that I didn't know how to name. And then I've learned how to go, God damn it, stop. And then put myself consciously, like training a dog. You know, okay, no, no, don't, you're not allowed to do that. Come back, start over, come back. And eventually your nervous system, it is trainable. It has its own consciousness. It is not you. Hmm. You're riding around in hardware that has automated stuff in it and you can train your hardware to behave itself. And when you do that, if you have racing thoughts at night, well, maybe just chilling out your nervous system consciously is what you want to do. Or maybe they're there because you have a problem with adrenal hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. And then you would address that nutritionally uh, or with circadian biology or with supplements. And so you, you, there's a device to monitor your heart. So you know, like what, what were you describing about the device? It's called the heart math device. And mm -hmm. it's a little, I don't have it on my desk right now. It's a little clip that goes on your ear and it talks to your phone by Bluetooth. And you just look at the phone and, and take a deep breath and breathe out. And when you breathe out, the light is either red or green. And you're like, I don't do anything different. Sometimes it's green, sometimes it's red. But eventually you go, oh, I am doing something. It's just something that doesn't have words. It is hard mm -hmm. to describe. It kind of feels like you're filling your heart up. You're turning on this very specific relaxation state. And it turns out you have the ability to replay any felt sense that you've ever experienced. So if you think about that one time when something cool happened and you felt the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, you can, if you just tune in, oh yeah, I remember that. And the hairs on the back of your neck will, will stand up. So you have replay abilities. You learn how to replay the sense of peace that I'm talking about. And then anytime you notice that you left that state, you just go, hang on. And then magically you're back. Hmm. So this is a skill. It's one that changed my entire life. And that led me down this great path of neurofeedback. 
to the point that, you know, I have a $16,000 five day huge brain upgrade thing with neuroscientists and four patents and we make our own hardware for reprogramming your brain. That's the ultimate expression of teaching your nervous system and your brain how to do it. But what I'm talking about is a couple hundred bucks that you could do. You could also take up a breathwork practice. This is free. It'll work similarly, but not as quickly. And I just interviewed an expert on yoga nidra um, who uh, was on, on my show. This is a practice I've written about for many years, and it's a basic uh, breathwork practice. And uh, Andrew Huberman calls it the physiological sigh, but it's essentially an old yogic technique for breathing that puts your body in a similar state. So breathwork alone or do a heart math device, those are ways to get control of the anxiety response. Um, the other thing that may be happening, I doubt it is with you, are you having a hard time going to sleep or staying asleep? Staying asleep. So if I wake up, I'll go to sleep right away. But if I wake up at 2 a.m., I have a hard time getting back. Got it. Racing thoughts? I don't know. Not really. No, okay. I mean, I feel, I feel like I, that I had and I don't have anymore. For whatever reason, most people who wake up between it's usually three to 5 a.m. and just can't go back to sleep. That is um, that is a crash in your blood sugar. Hmm. And what you do to find out if that's causing your problem, you get one of the CGMs uh, levels is the company that I've worked with. I'm an investor in levels. You get a little device, you stick it on the back of your arm. I've worn one for almost two years. And it tells you in the middle of the night, did your blood sugar crash? Most people who wake up feeling that way, oh, look, my blood sugar dropped to 70. And the body said, oh, I needed some glucose to power my brain to do its cleaning process at night. I'm out of glucose. Here, here's an answer. How about cortisol and adrenaline? Because those release sugar real quickly. Problem is cortisol and adrenaline wake you up. So the brain's like, yeah, thanks. I got what yeah. I needed. And you're going, I didn't get my sleep. This is not cool. So if you're one of those people, you have a small snack before bed, either raw honey or collagen or MCT oil, or just mix all three together. Wow. I totally did not know that. That's very yeah, interesting. It's a really big thing. And a lot of people run into that problem. I mean, you should, do you have a version of your coffee that is not caffeinated that has all the MCT oil and all that stuff in it? If you, Danger Coffee has a decaf that's fully mineralized, and there are lots of studies that show the longevity benefits of coffee work even with decaf. There are even more studies that show that caffeine itself is beneficial for you in normal doses for all kinds of reasons, even longevity. So you don't want caffeine after two o'clock. So what do you do? Decaf danger, but you still have to put your own stuff in there. So you, you can squirt some MCT in um, from any brand you like. C8 MCT works better. And I definitely made MCT a, a billion dollar category along with collagen and functional coffee uh, through my work at, at Bulletproof. So a lot of people are making that stuff now and you can buy it at you know Whole Foods or on Amazon. It's all over the place. Um, just squirt some in there and spin it around in a blender with a little hand frother and you're good to go. And as long as your body has energy, when you are asleep, you're probably not going to wake up nearly as much as you did before. So I, I want to I learn a little bit more also about just exercise and then get into the food stuff because the food okay. stuff is always confusing. Everybody says something different, but let's, let's talk about exercise first. I do not li like going to the gym. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not willing to like work out or exercise. I just can't stand going to the gym. You know, you sound like you might be lazy. I am lazy. Okay. So what I just did there, I triggered everyone listening to the show and so did you. Uh, and you and I share that uh, in common. We don't mind triggering people. Uh, and one of the mistakes I made with Smarter Not Harder was using the laziness principles. Look, people like to talk about lazy as much as they like to talk about death. Hmm. So here's what laziness means. And it's not what people think. It's that your body has its own intelligence and it thinks before you can think. So your body... It's tricking you. It's filtering reality. And a third of a second after your body sees something, it will show it to your brain. And we can measure this. And if you're 18 to 20 or you have a brain that's a little upgraded, it might be a quarter second instead of a third of a second. But there's this huge delay. And that's when the body goes, let's see here. There's the gym and there's a couch with cheesecake and Netflix. 
the couch with cheesecake and Netflix is always going to look sexy and attractive and easy. And that's because the body's like, hey, I don't know about that guy living in the head. He's really slow and stupid. So I need to make sure he doesn't starve to death. So just don't waste any energy by moving and eat everything. If you'll just do those, you won't die of a famine. So the, that's the body's goal. And it's wired in and it's worked for 2 billion years. And there's nothing wrong with you if you don't want to go to the gym and you want to eat everything. That's your hardware doing its job to survive. Now, there is something wrong with you if you think that that is you doing that and then you feel guilty over the fact that you want to do that. No, there's nothing wrong. It means your, your body is correct. Now, I'm willing to work hard and I've worked really hard. I just don't want to work any harder than is necessary. So now that you know your body is the one that's trying to make you eat everything and do, and do nothing, that means your body over prioritizes savings. And the laziness principle is a new technique in human motivation, as far as I can tell. And it's one of the big nuggets from Smarter Not Harder. And it goes like this. If the body's motivation is to save and you want to make yourself want to go to the gym, don't try to motivate yourself to go to the gym. Motivate yourself by saving time going to the gym. So do any of the hacks that are in Smarter Not Harder for cardio, for weights that work better than a normal workout. And then instead of saying, I'm going to go spend an hour sweating in the spin class, you're going to tell yourself, I'm going to spend five minutes instead of an hour, and I'm going to get six times better results. So your body is like, even though I'm going to save 55 minutes today and I don't have to sweat, I'm in. And then it doesn't feel like work. Mm -hmm. But if instead you say, well, I'm going to go do five minutes of working out, the body's going to say, no, that sounds like a lot of crap. Have you seen potato chips? Right? <laughs> so the companies who understand this are the ones who give you a coupon. How many times have you gone to the trouble? You go to a website, you enter your email, and they send you a coupon code. You open it, and, and they spam you for a while, and you get you save four bucks on something. It wasn't worth your time to save four bucks, but your body was like, no, this, I'm saving money, man. This $4 means a lot to me. Well, this is why we're willing to, to it feels like you're saving a lot more than $4 in that. So you motivate yourself by saving time and energy, not by expending it. So let's say, let's say you were only going to work out for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, whatever sure. small number you Here, want to pick. Here's, here's my, my entire weekly workout, 20 minutes for the entire week, not per day, 20 minutes for the entire week. And I am ripped and I'm. You are, I could see. Six, in fact, people are saying, Dave, you look old. I'm like, dude, I used to have 300 pounds of fat. I have extra skin because I don't have any fat in my face, but like the veins are everywhere. Like it's, it's insane. Um, and as a 300 pound computer hacker, this is unprecedented, but I don't work at this. It's just natural from learning how to eat and how to sleep and how to get exercise that actually works instead of 90 minutes a day, six days a week, which was my practice. So what do I do? I do an AI cardio called Rehit. And this is part of what we do at Upgrade Labs. And what you do for that is 15 minutes a week of cardio. You never sweat. And most of the time is moving so slowly it's boring. And three studies out of the University of Colorado show you get a 12% improvement in your VO2 max. That's equal to adding about two years onto the length of your life uh, mm -hmm. from the studies around VO2 max and longevity. You could instead say, I'm going to do an hour a day, five days a week. So that five hours a week versus 15 minutes a week. And that's going to get you 2% improvement. So why, so like what happens in the re-hit that, that makes up for all the time in the gym? Well, it turns out, and you would know this because you've, you've studied the way your brain works and in psychology and all our brains, they also can use a little bit of energy to make a decision, or they can use a lot of energy to make a decision. So you could look at something and go, well, if I know water's good, more water's better, right? And then you're gonna be fully confident or pretty confident in that. You're gonna go ahead and it's gonna feel like you're right. Now, the reality is too much water will kill you because either you'll drown or you'll dilute the salt, something called hyponatremia, which kills people in marathons every year who are overhydrating without electrolytes. So more is not better for anything. It just feels like more is better. So with exercise, if you want to get in shape for your cardio, more cardio is better. 
And it feels 100% true. It's BS. What your body listens to is not the amount of cardio you did. In fact, that probably is a negative signal for improvement. It is how quickly did you have to do the cardio? And this is the most important teaching from the entire book. How quickly did you return back to baseline? And did you have adequate nutrients like minerals and things like that and protein from animals? So if you go, oh, look, I was moving real slowly. Look, there's a tiger. You run away for 20 or 40 seconds from the tiger like you're going to die. Now you turned on the stress really fast. And then once the tiger's gone, you do deep breathing exercises and you calm yourself down and you calm yourself really rapidly because the signal that causes the most transformation in your biology is a stressor that came on quickly, a stressor that went away quickly. So now I'm safe and I have nutrients. If you're safe and you have nutrients, your body will put the nutrients into making you stronger. And if you do what they do in a spin class, you got away from the tiger, but now it's the next hill and they put on some more Taylor Swift. And then the person at the front of the things is stand up and you look around and if you're not the only one sitting down, you feel like an idiot. So they use shame to make you pretend like there's another tiger. An hour later, you're sweaty, you have endorphins, but your body's like, I just got hunted for an hour. I'm not gonna lower my heart rate for another hour and I don't have enough energy right now because I almost died. I'm not gonna improve. And this is why you get 2% better in five hours or do it my way, get 12% better in 15 minutes. Like it's so this, just easier. So this is really interesting because it's probably is related to the you know, the problem with modern society, if, if you call it a problem, is that we're just sitting at our desks and we're being chased by tigers. So we get this fight, or, looking at social media, we get this fight or flight reflex. And I wonder if it helps if you practice training the body to reduce from that stressor state as quickly as possible. I wonder if that practice helps naturally for the kind of fight and flight, fight or flight that we get during the day, you know, just normally looking at the screen. A hundred percent. In fact, if you have conscious control over your fight or flight response and you put your body out of it, the safer your body feels, the more it's willing to invest in getting younger, getting stronger, making hormones, running repair processes. And the more your body feels like there is a tiger just waiting around the corner, the less it's willing to invest in your longevity, in your cognitive function, in having healthy hormone levels. So if you use exercise to essentially whip yourself over and over at the end of a really long, stressful day, because it's how you burn off stress. The body's like, I, I never get any time without stress. Why would I do anything but get old? I'm not going to repair. I'm going to get ready for more stress. Hmm. This is why a meditation practice or a breath work practice, a neurofeedback practice, it's so important. You will get more out of your exercise if your body is relaxed. And the guy who's the biggest example of this who I've ever interviewed is not a neuroscientist, actually. It's Frank Zane, Mr. Olympia. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy has one of the most um, studied physiques and storied physiques in the bodybuilding world. And when I interviewed him, look, there's a stereotype for, for bodybuilders that a lot of people have. It's like, they're going to be kind of a meathead, right? This guy was like a meditation master. It's like, oh, no. What I do now, he's in his 70s and still ripped. And he's like, you know what I do? I play the flute for an hour a day and I write poetry. And he said the reason he was so successful was that he was calm and he meditated even back when he was in his competitive days hmm. because it was the ability to return to a calm, rested, safe, peaceful state that drives your body's willingness to improve. It's not how hard you can whip yourself. It's how hard you can hug yourself. But, but how did he, how do you build the muscle? Because muscle also creates energy for the body that improves your stamina. Mm, muscle won't necessarily improve your stamina, but it'll improve your metabolism. Uh, stamina mm. is a kind of a different metric. So how do you build the muscle? Number one, eat one gram of animal protein per pound of body weight. Per uh, day. Um, yeah, every single day. And this is hard to do. You have to measure it. And you just realize, wow, that's a lot of protein. And when you do it, your body will put on muscle much more quickly. So you're, you're, you said you're 198 pounds. How do you eat 198 grams of protein? Steak. I, I yeah. eat, uh, it's literally a couple of pounds of steak. So I'll eat a, a pound of steak and I'll use protein powder. But I don't use plant-based protein powder because it doesn't work. The studies all show it doesn't work. It's just not as available. If I wanted to do this as a vegan, I would need 400 at least, maybe 500 grams of plant-based protein 
And not only would I have room clearing gas, I would probably get gout from all the plant toxins in there. Like plant-based protein is what you feed peasants when you can't afford to feed them high quality animal protein. Hmm. The big companies know that. So, so, so you do that. And then it's the same rules. You need to stress the muscles more than they want in a small period of time. And with the part of smarter, not harder, or when you come into upgrade labs, um, in order to do this, we add stress to the body for the muscles that it's not used to getting. So what your body really knows how to do is handle gravity. You take a dumbbell, you flop it up, right? And then you lower it and your body says, oh, it's gravity. I understand. But because it's gravity, it knows that if it drops the weight or it wobbles a little bit, gravity makes the weight way more. So it holds back a lot of capacity. You could pick up more than you think you could, but the body won't let you because it knows you might break your elbow if you just wobble a little bit. So we use technology that changes the load on the muscle without any gravity involved whatsoever. The way to do this at home is resistance bands. They actually work differently than gravity and the body will put on muscle up to three times faster just from using a resistance band. And then I talk about other hacks in the book um, that are really interesting. Uh, there's one called blood flow restriction. If you restrict some but not all of the blood flow going into your muscles, you can put on muscles without lifting more than a one pound pink dumbbell. So mm -hmm. instead of changing weight, which is a danger for your joints, you change blood flow and lactic acid builds up and all of a sudden you get ripped with very little weight involved. So there's all these technologies that work. There's electrical stimulation. And what we do at Upgrade Labs is called the AI cheat machine. And this uses AI to vary the load on your muscle in a way that mother nature never could. So your body says, oh, I guess I need to adapt in a different way. You do it and you put on muscle very quickly. Like I said, 20 minutes a week. And I, I've never been this lean and ripped. Okay, well, which brings me to food. So, you know, in the book, you really go through a lot of different myths about food and what's good and what's bad. And, you know, it was interesting to see which foods, you know, you talk about this thing called phytic acid that I had never heard about and that it, it, it basically does a lot of harm to your system. And it's kind of hidden inside all of these foods that, are, that people commonly eat that I would never think were bad. Well, a lot of this comes because I started a regenerative farm on Vancouver Island where I lived for 13 years. And when you have sheep and pigs and cows and chickens, you learn a lot about what they eat and what makes them sick and what doesn't make them sick. Ranchers all know this. When you feed chickens or, or sheep, it doesn't really matter. You, you feed them these grains, corn and soy and things like that. It has so much phytic acid that it steals minerals away from the animals and then they lose their fertility and they start getting sick and their hooves fall off and they get mange or they die. And that's expensive when you're trying to raise chickens. So you realize pretty soon, if I'm going to feed these crappy things like corn that these animals really didn't evolve to eat, that it's high in phytic acid, I'm going to have to add special enzymes so the animals can handle it. It just so happens that all of the animals I just mentioned, they have onboard enzyme manufacturing. They can digest some of those foods. We don't. So when we eat chicken food, it steals minerals from our bones and from our cells, and we get mineral deficient. And this is well known amongst vegans. And I raised my hand, guys. I was a devout, raw vegan. I had salad bowls bigger than my head. I blended, I chopped, I sprouted, and I shattered three teeth and gave myself an autoimmune condition and made my thyroid worse. And after... Oh, about 18 months of doing that, I, uh, I gave up. Thank God I went to Tibet where you couldn't get anything raw because eating raw yak would be kind of gross. So it's, it, it's one of those things where I lived it. And the reason I shattered teeth, even though I was a very well-trained uh, guy doing all the seaweed and all the stuff you're supposed to do, sea moss, which actually shreds your gut, all those things, I just realized, wow, I did myself great harm. And the reason you see me online railing against kale I've been doing that forever. Is it kale and spinach and even beets, almonds? These are high either in phytic acid or oxalic acid, and oxalic acid is even worse. Well, the bottom line is plant babies, which is what seeds and nuts are, plants really don't want you to eat them. And since plants can't run away or punch you in the face, 
they just put chemicals in their babies. So if you eat very many of their babies, you can't have babies, which means over time there will be balance. And, and, and this is yeah. this is fascinating because this is where you overlap with. So I've had on a couple of times uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry. He talks all oh, yeah. about the lectins you mentioned in the in the book. You mentioned Gundry in the book. And basically his point is the same as yours, which is that seeds, like you say, are it's a good way to put it. They're plant babies. And so they have poison yeah. to protect them. If you go back, my, my first big book was called The Bulletproof Diet. People lost a couple million pounds uh, on the diet. And chapter one, I'm like, hey, there's five things plants are doing to you that you don't know about. There's lectins, there's phytates, there's oxalates, which are a major cause of all sorts of health problems people don't know about. Um, there's histamine, which a lot of people post COVID are really dealing with histamine in their food. They can't handle it. And then there's mold toxins that are a common problem. Uh, and omega-6 oils was in there as well. If I didn't already mention it. So like, those are the problems with plants. I'm not saying you shouldn't eat plants. I'm not against carbohydrates, even though people somehow think I only eat, only eat, um, fat and meat and I'm Mr. Keto. No, keto is a tool for brain function and losing weight for short periods of time if you need it, but I'm not in ketosis most of the time but I have ketones present because I do intermittent fasting. So I eat carbs almost every day and mm -hmm. I don't limit them. At this point, limiting carbs at 6% body fat would be dumb. I don't need to do it. So what carbs do I eat? Not carbs that are full of toxins. And this is the thing. Not all plants do the same thing to you. Not all proteins do the same thing to you. And butter is different than canola oil. So we like to say, what are your macros? How much protein? Sarin nerve gas is a protein. Spider venom is a protein. Gluten's a protein. Beef is a protein. Which protein were we talking about? Because they're unrelated hmm. in what they do to your body. So in terms of, it, okay, just like a sample diet for someone, what would you eat for breakfast, dinner? So I tend to eat one to one and a half meals a day. I, so I do intermittent fasting. Okay. How, how much do you weigh? I weigh about 150. How much do you want to weigh? Uh, I'm pretty good with 150. Okay. I'm pretty good with my weight. So how do you put a- I've, I've like weighed the same weight since high school. Beautiful. You're lucky. Um, how do you eat 150 grams of animal protein in a meal and a half a day? I I probably don't. I'll tell no, you I mean, one, one, one thing I do. I mean, just for me, I, I eat sushi almost every night and I don't know if that's good or bad. You're almost certainly protein deficient. Mm -hmm. And I say this when I travel, I eat a lot of sushi because it's one of the things that's widely available. It has fewer man-made uh, flavor enhancers and chemicals and colors and things like that. And it. the only problem is that they don't, they don't get that much fish. I mean, you get hamachi kama if you want to get some extra protein, which is one of my favorite sushi dishes, you know, the, the fish collar grilled. But if you're eating sushi every night, you're getting high levels of mercury and probably some lead, that affects your brain function directly the next day. So if you're gonna mm -hmm. eat a lot of sushi, you have to take chlorella, which is a kind of algae that will stick to the mercury that's in the fish. If we did a blood test right now, or a pee test, you would have probably scary high levels of mercury. Um, same thing happened to me when I was doing tons of sushi. So what you're gonna have to do, and, and this is, it's actually really funny. I did the math about two years ago, and I said, all right, I'm going to try doing a gram of protein per pound of body weight because I've recommended it in my books, but I hadn't really always measured it. And sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. So I started to be religious and I realized I travel 50% and I'm never getting enough protein. You want to get a pound of steak when you're traveling? You go to the average restaurant, you're going to order three main courses to get a pound of steak. And, you know, $400 later or something, you finally got it and you have to throw all these fried French fries or whatever it came with a steak. Like it's really hard to do that. So I also said, well, all the research that we know says you can absorb at most 50 grams of protein per pound of body weight, but I eat two meals a day. Like, how do I get 200 grams? So I said, the studies must be wrong. And I started religiously eating 100 grams of protein. That's a lot. That's a pound of steak per meal. And I take digestive enzymes. If you eat too much protein and you can't digest it, you'll get bodybuilder farts. You will clear the room and you'll know you have a problem. Take your enzymes. So I take my digestive enzymes when I eat my protein. I do 100 grams of protein per meal if I eat two meals. Hmm. I might eat you know, a steak and take some protein powder as well. And I just don't miss it. And I travel with protein powder. And interestingly, just a month ago, 
a study came out that really made the, the rounds online in biohacking and bodybuilding circles. Some researchers figured out that there is no upper limit to how much protein your body can absorb. The, the 50 grams of protein was just a myth, just like drinking eight glasses of water or walking 10,000 steps. There's no science behind either of those. Those are just made up marketing numbers from someone a long time ago. So turns out you can absorb insane amounts of protein. So your job, get a protein powder and chug 50 grams of protein before you eat every time. And do that for one month, James, and then text me and tell me that your sleep is better, your chest is better, that you're ripped. It's not that hard. You're just not eating enough protein. What, what protein powder do you recommend? Anything animal-based that your body likes. The cheapest and most affordable and accessible is grass-fed whey protein concentrate. Um, you can also get egg protein if you're not allergic to it. Some people handle eggs well. Some people don't. Sadly, I don't. I think eggs are really good for if you can handle them. Uh, I gave myself an egg allergy um, when I was coming out of that vegan period um, because I had such bad leaky gut. There's, uh, there's also beef protein. You can buy beef protein powder. You can use some collagen protein powder, but it shouldn't be your only protein. Um, and some people can use other types of dairy protein depending on your allergic sensitivities. So basically a few scoops of whey protein is what most people take away from that, but you can buy different kinds of animal protein. And you just mix um, it with water and drink it? Yeah. That's one way to do it. Some people will put it in a smoothie, throw in some blueberries and, you know, throw in some, you know, whatever sweetener stuff you like that's natural. Um, the easiest thing to do when you're traveling is I will put it, I'll brew my danger coffee. It, it's, it's a crime. I put protein powder in the coffee. It doesn't taste great. Coffee's just amazing by itself. But I put it in there because hot coffee will melt any kind of protein powder. You put it in there, you shake it up in a sealed mug, and then you drink it. And it didn't taste great. Didn't taste bad either. And then I've got my protein for the day and then I have another cup of coffee for flavor. And that's what I do when I travel. But at home, I put it in a blender with some frozen blueberries. So blueberries at least are good. You didn't mention fruits that much. Uh, so I was wondering yeah. about that. Fruits kind of piss me off. So <laughs> even in the, the kind of edges of the carnivore world, I'm not a carnivore. I tried the carnivore thing uh, when I was writing the Bulletproof Diet and I felt great for the first 60 days and I destroyed my sleep architecture and got leaky gut after uh, several months of it, which is also common. So it's great for a cleanse, but not long-term, just like keto, great for a cleanse, not long-term. So some people, including like really good friends, I, I love Paul Saladino. It's like, well, you know, fruit, mother nature wants you to eat fruit. So let's eat fruit. But some fruit causes gout and kidney stones. 70% mm. of kidney stones are caused by plants. Hmm. And not by eating meat. And if you're eating kiwi fruits and especially red raspberries and pineapple, these fruits are really high in oxalates. And if you wake up the next morning with a sore back and a sore joints and brain fog and crusty eyes, and you're like, Ugh, that was fruit that wasn't so good for you. Other kinds of fruit don't necessarily do that. The highest benefit, lowest inflammation fruit is definitely blueberries. So mm -hmm. I eat a lot of blueberries. What about, I, and it's funny because I had red raspberries right before this podcast, like literally minutes before this podcast. But uh, what about blackberries? I, I pretty much eat only raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. All right. Those are my fruits. I was like you once. Uh, on Vancouver <laughs> Island, heck, we had wild blackberries everywhere. And we grew our own raspberries. I, I'm going to take you back to when I was a raw vegan. I used to go to the farmer's market in Mountain View, California, and I'd buy an entire flat of raspberries and I'd spread them out on, in, on a paper towel in the fridge and I would eat two boxes of raspberries a day. And after about six months, I noticed I have to pee like 25 times a day and it's like really mm. urgent pee. And if I don't pee, I'm gonna like wet myself. Like I'm, I'm in my 30s, this is stupid. So I go to the doctor, he goes, well, see a urologist. So I go to the top urologist in San Francisco. Guy rams a camera in my pee hole. It was one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. Oh, I can't do it. It was, it was not something I ever want to repeat. And at the end of it, he goes, nah, I don't see anything. I'm like, you're that to see nothing. Like, well, I finally figured out it was the raspberries. And one of the, one of the women that I, I've dated, um, because I, I got consciously uncoupled a few years ago, um, she had interstitial cystitis. And I looked, I'm like, stop with the raspberries and the beets. 
three days later, she calls and goes, it's gone. Hmm. What happens is raspberries and blackberries are very high in oxalic acid and raspberries are much higher. And oxalic acid forms razor sharp microscopic calcium crystals in your kidneys and your urethra that cause chronic infections. Oh my God. So th this is what's stressing me out. Like what can I eat? <laughs> White rice in sushi. Yeah, white rice. White rice is good. There's not much bad stuff in white rice. They've taken out the arsenic. They've taken out the lectins. Um, it's, it's relative. What do you put on the rice to flavor it, though? Because um, you don't do soy. Fish, beef. Even a third of Japan eats their sushi with sea salt instead of soy sauce. Hmm. You could do, if you tolerate it, you could do um, the gluten-free soy sauce. But a lot of people, a huge number of people, they eat it and they get really tired or they get hives, or they get some other symptoms, it's because soy sauce, including gluten-free, is very high in histamine. If you had COVID, you probably have a histamine disorder. It, it causes this, all these long-haul COVID people, they have histamine problems from mast cells. So I just found that for me, being Mr. Sensitive with, with autoimmune conditions and all these health things when I was a kid, if you give me soy sauce, my face gets puffy, and I get itchy, and then I get tired, and I want sugar, and it's just not worth it. But if you handle soy sauce, put some soy sauce on there. You'll probably get more hypoglycemia and want dessert. So I use sea salt. And when I'm I gonna try rice, that. Oh, there's this cool thing called butter. And you put that on the rice. So so rice, I know grass-fed beef is is one of your favorites. Rice, beef, lamb, um, pastured pork. pork. You can eat some pastured pork, absolutely. Um, pork is relatively high in histamine and toxins unless it's well-treated. So the quality of your pork matters more than the quality of your beef. Um, anything with hooves is good. Uh, you can eat chicken. It's not as good as beef, but it's a lot better than not eating animal protein. And after that, dairy. It depends what kind of dairy you handle. I love sheep's milk yogurt. Sheep's milk is the most compatible with humans, followed by goat, followed by, um, by raw or A2, grass-fed dairy. Um, I wouldn't eat commercial dairy under most, most circumstances because the cows make the wrong kind of protein for humans. So that's where your protein and fat comes from, right? And then you eat some veggies and some veggies are great. Some are not so good. Those are all in the Bulletproof diet. You'll see me eating broccoli and cauliflower. You won't see me eating the nightshade family like bell peppers and things. Those are hard on most people. Uh, you're not going to see me eating okra because it tastes like snot and it's also a nightshade. Uh, and Beets are not good for you. And you see all these, these poor people, they're like, oh, well, you know, this beet ma includes, it makes nitric oxide. Well, maybe it, sometimes it does. But if I gave you a cyanide pill that also made nitric oxide, would you take it? You would say no. So why don't we look at the negative stuff that's in the vegetable and minimize that and then get the positive stuff? And there's lots of ways to raise nitric oxide without eating something that causes kidney stones like beets do. So, okay, so let's say you went to, out to breakfast with friends and what do you order other than, you know, you can't even order coffee unless you bring danger coffee with you. I mean, you, you can, it's just not as good. So I, yeah. I might order the coffee if it's good or now I'm going to be a real douchebag. I'll order a pot of hot water and I just pour my own coffee grounds in there because I am, uh -huh. I am the CEO of danger coffee. Jeez. But you can order, um, you can order coffee, you can order tea, and green tea is a lot better than black tea. Black tea is also one of the causes of kidney stones. And what you're going to find is there's usually smoked salmon, which is a really good choice in any of those buffets. They go to a hotel, there's smoked salmon. There's some avocado. Um, there's some mm. fruit. You can eat some fruit. I wouldn't go heavy on the kiwis and pineapple and raspberries, but eat the blueberries and eat the melons. It's not a big deal. I don't normally want fruit in the morning other than maybe a few uh, blueberries, but hey, going out with friends, it's okay. Uh, if you're not sensitive to eggs, hallelujah, you got the whole omelet bar there. The trick there is you tell the guys two things. Number one, make it with fresh eggs you crack because most of these guys are using egg substitute, or not egg substitute, but egg replacement. They buy big jugs of pre-mixed eggs where some things are taken in and added. It doesn't taste as good and it sounds good for you. And tell them, cook it in butter. Don't cook it in that crappy salad oil stuff you're using. And most places will do it. And then now you had an omelet with lots of good saturated fat that helps you make hormones. You had a lot of protein and you're good to go. Throw in some turkey, throw in some chicken, throw in some whatever other stuff they have to put in there. It's not that hard. Just don't eat the French toast. 
Oh man, it's the French toast I love, but okay. I know, right? I'm with you there. Maybe they have gluten-free French toast. And that's something else. People get on this idea that, well, if I, if I cheat on my diet, it's a cheat day and it's just okay. I'll just go crazy. No, you can have a day where you say, I'm not going to follow all my principles, but it doesn't mean eat the fried Snickers bar because you have cravings for a long time. So you can say, I'm going to do a really high sugar, high carb day, but make it with ice cream, which has dairy fat instead of with churros, which is like gluten and damaged omega-6 oils and sugar. Like there's a big difference in your outcome. So literally cheat with cheesecake instead of cheating with junk food. And you totally change how I feel. I will, I will on weekends with my kids, I'll make pancakes. I'm going to make them out of rice flour. I'll put maple syrup on them. I'll make them with butter, right? No, it's not perfect by a long shot. It's just, okay, now my blood sugar went up, but I didn't have to deal with food colorings, food agents, 48 hours of inflammation from the seed oils. That's more inflammation than smoking a cigarette. Like I, I had a great breakfast. It was fun. Everyone's fine. We drink extra coffee and we went out and we went for a walk to keep our blood sugar stable. It's not this, it's not that crazy. It's like high quality food. So, okay. So we talked about the exercise, the food, we talked about vitamin Dake, which I'm going to order from, I got that website that you mentioned up on the screen right now. And, but now supplements. So there's all these, I, I can't even, I can't even deal with the whole supplement industry. Yeah. There's like, and, and cause I feel when I start reading about it, I feel like I want to have everything. And you, t you talk about so many supplements in the book, but I'll, I'll tell you what I do. I do, uh, the NAD plus stuff and from, from Qualia. Yep. Uh, no, I do it from Thorn. Okay. Uh, and, and that's basically, then I do, I, I do quercetin to absorb i don't know it interacts with the nad plus to to i don't know how and i'll do <laughs> zinc and magnesium cool so i like that you're doing zinc and magnesium uh, i really want you to take minerals 101 from the vitamin dake.com website because the opposite of zinc is copper you're probably copper deficient most people are uh, you're also not getting molybdenum that is by yeah. the way a metal that I will never know how to pronounce, Molly B. Denim. And I know this because when I read the audiobook for Smarter Not Harder, I had to go back and re-say that word like 5,000 times and I still don't remember the correct spelling. So anyway, that's a really important mineral for recycling uh, glutathione and for uh, being able to digest enough protein. So you're deficient in those minerals almost certainly. So that's why I made a broad spectrum mineral supplement. So you just have all the minerals your body needs, not just zinc and magnesium, although those are two of the most important ones. Um, that's going to help you a lot. And then what you're going to do, because you don't want to become an expert on all this stuff. I'm about two months out from launching the AI tool that will guide you on what to do. Till then, and that'll be on daveasprey.com. And it'll be with Upgrade Labs. Uh, some members will get access to it. But uh, what you're going to do is you're going to say, what do I want? And you're going to get a cognitive enhancement formula that you really like. And you're going to use that every day. And there's a variety of them out there. Um, I've worked with Neurohacker on even formulating theirs. I like their formula a lot. It's called Qualia Mind. There's probably code Dave or something. I have no idea if that's the code. You know, I have mind. Qualia Mind. Do you take but it? You, gotta, uh, you know, you got to take six a day. And so sometimes I just don't want to okay. take six a day. So here's the thing. How many pills can you swallow at one time? Two. Have you ever shotgunned a beer? No, I get like a, I get a gag reflux pretty easily. All right. So what you want to do is get like a banana and just like ram it down. Okay. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> you, you can learn. And I've taught so many people how to take five or six pills at a time and you won't have a gag reflux when you do it. The trick is take two pills and put them in your mouth and then fill your mouth as full of water as you can. And toss it back and gulp the water. Like open up your throat like you would just take a big swig of something. Mm. And then the next day do three. And the next day do four. And pretty soon you can do five or six. I can swallow as many pills as will fit in my hand. It's probably like really? 40. And a while back, Liver King, uh, who's got hilarious social media, he, he swallows 20 liver pills. He's like, you know, oh, anyone who can... You can have more pills than me in one swallow is, is more of a man or something. And so I'm like, 
I, I'm not the Liver King vibe. You know, full respect. Uh, I, I actually like it that he's a biohacker. Uh, I don't have a problem that he uses a lot of uh, performance enhancers. I just like it when you disclose all that stuff. So I ripped my shirt off and, and I took 40 pills. And I like, I see you and I raise you 20, Liver King. And it was kind of funny because people called him Liver Queen for all of 30 seconds afterwards. But yeah, you can swallow 40 pills. It's the same that most people did in college with beer. It's just mm -hmm. the same skill. So you can get over that. I mean, good God, James, you, you've done so many amazing things to like pr press the edges of what humans can do. I know you can swallow six pills in one swallow and then the problem is solved. All right. So I'm, I'm going to do this, but then, but then it's like, where do you stop? So there's zinc, there's molybdenum. Well, there's... These are all, when, when you get the, um, when you get the minerals one one formula, it's three pills that have all of the minerals you need in them. Okay. Right. And then so vitamin D is one pill and it's tiny. You won't even notice it. And you take three mineral pills and you don't have to take your zinc separately. You probably still want to take magnesium because you need a lot of that. That takes about three pills for most people to get their magnesium. What do you I think of the NA, yeah. NAD plus stuff, the, the anti-aging stuff? I, I think there's a good argument for it. Um, mm -hmm. You can take niacinamide for people listening who want to save money. Niacinamide is a longevity uh, form of vitamin B that we've used for thousands of years. I'm still not. I got you talking too fast. Austin. When I moved to Austin. Man, everybody moved to Austin. Every single person moved I mean, to Austin. I love Austin, but man, we have something called cedar fever here. And uh, I've, I've had allergies for a while and I've gotten on top of them pretty good. Man, the cedar stuff, it just hits you like, like this. They call it cedar fever because people react so strongly. It raises your body temperature. I know something about allergies, but. I haven't mastered that one yet. So NAD, nice niacinamide, and... has been in our diet for thousands of years. But in the longevity world, we've used it for the last 30 years to raise NAD levels. It's very affordable. But take your NAD stuff from Thorne. It sounds like good stuff to me. Okay, so two more questions. You mentioned creatine in the book for cognitive enhancement. I never thought of it. For, I, so I have Jocko Willing's uh, creatine powder that he sells. I don't know if it's good or bad or what. Jocko's great. Uh, I remember interviewing him. Um, live uh, for one of my book launches and you know it comes in like this guy could like kill everyone in the room but he's actually a really calm and peaceful presence like he's got yeah. the strength but also the peacefulness of a warrior and yes his creatine is great because all creatine works it doesn't have to be fancy there's some evidence for something called uh, creatine gg um but it's probably not that big of a difference so I would say, any but it kind does, of but it does help. It does work. It works really well. And it works via mitochondrial enhancement. Just one morning, a small number of men lose hair from creatine. So if you start taking creatine and you're shedding your hair, you're probably one of those, but most people don't have that. And then creatine makes your brain work better. It also makes your muscles work better. It's just a good thing to do. Okay. So that's creatine. The last question I have is testosterone. Oh, I, I forget if we were talking before the podcast or on the podcast. I haven't had this tested, but I'm 56 years old. I was talking at the, I was giving a talk at the, in the metal group, which you obviously know about. And in the middle of my talk, everyone started like texting. This guy needs to test his testosterone. Dude, you're 56 and you've never tested your testosterone? No, I've never tested anything. Are you trying to enhance your feminine presence or something? <laughs> No, but I just never, I never really thought about it. I never really thought okay. it would be an issue. Right now, testosterone is an emergency issue for humanity. People in their 20s have half the testosterone that they did 30 years ago. So if you're 20 and you have normal testosterone, you have the same levels your grandfather had 30 years ago. This is environmental pollution. It's plastics, it's fragrances, uh, Axe body spray those little pine trees and the Uber you ride in, um, probably half the stuff you smear on your body. It's a big deal. So when I had lower testosterone than my mom in my, uh, in my 20s, um, I got it tested. I've been on testosterone since I was 26. I took three years off when I was developing the Bulletproof Diet to see if I could get my levels up naturally. You can. It's an enormous amount of work. You have to do everything perfect including get your sleep every night. And if you travel 50% like I do, you're not going to do it. Anyone over age 40, you're probably low on testosterone for men and women. And testosterone matters, James, not because it's going to give you, you know, morning wood, 
or make you all ripped. It might do both of those. It's, it's a dopamine and testosterone ride together. So when your testosterone is low, your dopamine is low. When your dopamine is low, you don't care about making a difference in the world as much. And when your testosterone is high, your dopamine is higher, and then you're motivated to be a good father, a good provider, to be a good person, to do stuff that makes a difference. So if you want a programmable bunch of tired, overwhelmed people, you lower their testosterone with environmental chemicals, and that's what's happening to us. The solution is really straightforward. You can inject testosterone, you can put testosterone cream on your balls or your armpits, you can put testosterone gel in the same places, and they just came out with an oral form of testosterone. Some people use enclomiphene. Uh, there's a company called Maximus that pioneered doing that. It's, it's a small microdose of a pharmaceutical that naturally raises your, your testosterone. And or you can oral? take oral testosterone pills now. Yeah, what's, there's two what's oral the, forms. I see, because Maximus like sends me email ads. So like, what yeah. do they do? So what they use is a, a, a pharmaceutical that I started taking along with testosterone when I was... Uh, 26 that my doctor recommended. And it's uh, a small dose of a drug that causes your body to secrete more testosterone naturally. People get about a 50% testosterone uh, boost from that. Um, full disclosure, I'm friends with the owner. I'm a small investor and advisor to Maximus. So I just, I'm, you know, I'm not going to make any, any financial changes in my life if you or anyone listening does it, but I don't like, I don't want anything undisclosed there. I just backed mm -hmm. it. So I'm like, this is a cool way to raise testosterone that doesn't require you to smear it on or inject it or get a pellet. Um, the final thing, though, is a new form of testosterone that just got approved. It's an oral form. And you just take a pill. It's called testosterone undecanoate. And like you go to any doctor and you get tested and then Most they prescribe it? I don't know about that last one. I would go to Maximus first and see if that works. They'll test you as well. You got to run the test. And then after you do the test, you figure out the form you want to try. Maximus is probably the, the lowest hanging fruit, easiest to do. And then if you don't get the results you want, I would go for uh, probably an injection if you have younger kids around, or I would go for the cream if you don't have younger kids around. Why, why injection if you have younger kids around? If you're using the cream and you have some left on your arm or your hand or your sheets and you get a little testosterone cream on a two-year-old, it's going to have a meaningful effect because two-year-olds aren't supposed to have endocrine disruptors. They're also not supposed to have sex hormones until later in life. There is a reason that girls are entering puberty at six years old now. It's environmental chemicals. So you don't need to add to that burden by throwing a little testosterone into the mix. I see. All right. I'm going to do all of this, Dave. So James, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change my life. You have my mobile number. Just text me if you need advice on any of this. You're 56. There is no way that our government should allow anyone over 50 to not have a testosterone test to know where they are. You want to lower your all-cause mortality. You want to lower your Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, cancer risk. Have the testosterone levels of a 30-year-old. And if we can send yeah. like hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine and we can't provide testosterone for our men and our women when they need it, and most of them do, and we can't buy good school lunches for our kids, then someone doesn't care about you. Why, why do you need to have a prescription for testosterone? Why can't I just go to the store and buy it? Like they make it very complicated. Um, it's called a trade union, the American Medical Association. <laughs> They're the same ones that make you have a prescription to get glasses. And the rest of the world just go into the glasses store and say, I need ones this strong. And they just give them to you. So the U.S. is set up very carefully so that we spend 20% of our national income on our, <laughs> uh, on our health care, more than on national defense. It's insane. And hmm. no, you shouldn't need this. You should need a lab test so you know what you need. And then you should get your testosterone. 1970s Puritans, roid rage from synthetic testosterone. That's not even the same thing. And just a lot of fear. Bottom line, though, is testosterone and thyroid are the two hormones that matter most for humans to have energy and motivation. And this goes back to, surprisingly, to danger coffee and not minerals or whatever. It's, it's called danger coffee because who knows what you might do? And you need testosterone to do anything that matters. Otherwise, it just feels like too much work. And you need thyroid to have the electricity and the heat in your body to do it. I want people at full power with motivation to do great things because then you're going to say no to stupidity. You're going to help the little lady across the street and you're not going to lose your mind when someone yells at you in traffic. Like that's the world we want to live in. Strong, powerful people with testosterone, with thyroid, with minerals, with a good night's sleep because you can't be programmed that way.
You're going to turn off the news because it's stupid and you're going to be hard to trick. And I want people like that in the world around me. Well, Dave, so do I. And we didn't even really touch the surface of what you're talking about in, in Smarter, Not Harder, The Biohacker's Guide to Getting the Body and Mind You Want by Dave Asprey. I mean, we did touch upon the surface, but there's so much depth to the book. Thank you. Again, that's why I was feeling a little almost overwhelmed, but I'm glad we had a chance to to talk because it cleared up uh, so many issues and highly recommend the book. I've read, in the course of doing this podcast, I've read, you know, hundreds of these sort of books. And I always keep coming back to you, Dave, because it's, it's always great advice, great guidance. And uh, I was a fan of the Bulletproof Diet. I'm a fan of this. So... Thanks once again for for coming on the show. Uh, James, you're one of the more interesting guys I've ever interviewed. You just see the world through different eyes. I love it that you're competing in chess and and making your brain young again. You're, you're one of the more curious people out there. So it's always a pleasure to see you, my friend. Thanks, Dave. Talk to you soon.